So what I wanted to say is, with this illustration, I kind of want it, it's obviously a physical illustration, but I want to liken it perhaps to our spiritual lives and perhaps to some of the ways we think of our spiritual lives. And I don't know about you, but this week I've had my own ups and downs. Even this morning I woke up, as Kerry said to me, stop whining. I was whining a bit uh, because I didn't feel too crash hot and I knew I had a lot on today and it's been a massive week. And so I was like, oh man, I just feel so tired. And I don't know about you, but like, this is sometimes how I think about my life. Like, so this represents the eternal abundance of God's blessing. Let's just imagine this can never be empty, this blue jug of water. It can never be empty. Sort of like blue, colour the sky, you know, infinite, eternal. And, and so it's sort of like, oh, ooh, I'm spilling stuff. Don't worry, it's okay. It's plastic. Um, it's like God pours into our lives. You know, he gives us, gives us life. He gives us energy. He gives us spiritual energy and then we've sort of got that to spend in a sense i don't know that's how i sort of think of it and so this morning i wake up and i'm like oh man i'm feeling like i don't i don't know how much energy i've got but i think i've used it on something that, how much is actually there oh. is anyone else feeling that way you see the little droplet at the bottom can't put your hand up if you're feeling that yes i knew there'd be some um, so you go well lord bring me back give me give me some more energy and it's like but I don't feel like I've got this energy. So anyway, but then maybe you hear a song or you hear, a, like we heard this morning, a, something that really speaks to you and you feel a bit more filled up again, right? A little bit more filled up, okay? So meanwhile, out in the world, there's, or even in your own family, there's people that also need something and God's put you there. He's given you everything you need. We've to, we're told in uh, Peter that he's given us everything that we need for life and godliness, everything we need. So, and, and, and that's so that we can participate in the divine nature and so we can serve the world and serve each other and so forth. And so, you know, here's the world waiting. Here's our families. Here's the people that are in our spheres of influence. They're waiting. They're waiting to get some spiritual water, some spiritual life. This is going to sate their spiritual thirst. It's actually going to give them eternal life. And, uh, and so here we are. Here's the, here's the heavenly water, the, the springs of heavenly water. Here's our lives. Here's the world. You with me so far? Haven't lost you. And then uh, we sort of come to this book of Samuel. And as we come to Samuel, I want us to think about this term. This is God's country. This is God's country. All right, now, before we move on. So here's our lives. Now, I don't know about you, but I need coffee in the morning because coffee kind of satisfies. Coffee does something for us. It's almost a spiritual experience, wouldn't you say, Tim, sometimes? Um, and I'm sure this is top quality stuff. So, you know, we, we get a bit of coffee in there. Uh, <clears throat> that helps us out. Maybe we haven't had time to really, I don't know, seek God, you know, go into the, what the old saints used to say, the prayer closet and just spend time. We haven't had time for that, but we've had our coffee. Um, now as well, there's some things that we kind of probably fill our lives up with. We don't call them toys anymore, but recreational type things. Um, you know, we've got a bit of that. Also, we've got things like houses. Here's the keys to the house, right? We've got to, they all take time. Don't worry, they're, they're waterproof. Don't worry, Kerry. They are. Um, they're, non, they're non-electronic, so water's not going to hurt them. Just go with me, babe. Go with me. Uh, anyway, so we filled up our lives with some stuff, and we're kind of going, oh, now looking around. Who, who would like a drink, by the way? You, you want some of this? This black looking stuff with all the stuff? You want some? You want some? <laughs> Let's just leave that there for now. The keys are fine, babe. <laughs> so this is God's country. I come from uh, originally Melbourne, then we moved to Africa, then we ended up in a place called Northeast Victoria. And it's a beautiful place. Here's a little photo uh, of some of the mountains. There's mountains, snow, rivers are flowing all the time. It's really called God's country. Uh, and I remember at Kajiwal North where there was this dirt road. People used to come tearing down that road doing like 120 kilometres per hour. Clouds of dust billowing up everywhere. So this one day someone put a sign up and it was, this is God's country, why drive like hell? And I remember thinking, oh, that's like, because it's only little. And I guess I just come from Africa. I remember seeing that and going, oh man, that's swearing, that's terrible. Like, why, why? I mean, it probably shocked you even just then when I put it up there a little bit. But think about it, like, it's God's country. It's beautiful. We just heard before about praise Yah, praise Yahweh from the heavens, praise Him in the heights, praise Him all His angels, you know, praise Him 
uh, stormy wind fulfilling his world, mount, word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all livestock. Praise him, all you shining stars. From Psalm 148, it's a beautiful world. We heard that poem, my children are so young they cannot imagine a world like the one they live in. It's a beautiful world. And so the question for me is, if this is God's country, if this world is God's world, then why live like hell? Why live like hell? Well, it's actually a genuine question. Like, why do we live like hell? And you might go, oh, no, it's not that bad. Well, these are the good... Th I just got this offline yesterday. I just literally went to my news feed uh, and I went to top stories and you've got cocaine escorts and unpaid workers, parliament security embarrassment. You've got a very angry Theresa May or a very worried, depending on how you want to look at that, and parliamentarians behind her worrying about Brexit. You've got... Eddie McGuire having a go at someone who has no legs. Uh, you've got sports. You've got Trump doing his thing. And then, of course, the trending stories, which are the stories that people like and continue to read. 69 millionaires paid zero tax in Australia in 2016, 2017. What's going on with Prince William and that Marchioness? I don't know, what is that? Marchioness, thank you. <laughs> Did I detect a little bit of irritation there that I got it wrong? Marchioness. <laughs> no, I was like, oh, well, that's a lot. Uh, anyway, on and on, how the Liberals are stuck in a long, demented cycle of vengeance. Now, I don't know about you, but actually they're pretty, pretty um, mild, aren't they, headlines, compared to some of the ones that we've had. And, you know, you couple this with our known problems in the world, climate change, the polarisation that many people are talking about, the hatred, the shootings, the terrorism, the... The women, the girls, the minorities are being treated so terribly, slaughtered, hated, brutalised. Brutalized. It reminds me of this sermon, which I preached only a few weeks ago at the tail end of Judges, which I just called vile. I, couldn't, I didn't know what else to call it because Judges 17 to 21, as we came through the mega series, was just vile. There was corruption. There was Vileness through every thread of society. There were sons stealing from their mothers, mothers promising money to God, then keeping it, making it an idol. A woman terribly abused, runs away, brought back to her abusive husband, raped, cut up, war, slaughter, more rape, more pillaging, more violence, initiated by the Levites. The priesthood, the priesthood completely corrupted and initiating this kind of stuff. And into all of this, we come to a little boy called Samuel. Like it, it I'm just, I don't know, I don't know about you, but like it, I'm just astounded by that. I'm absolutely flabbergasted that we could come to the last judge of Israel and as Ben has pointed out so well, come to the last judge of Israel and we've seen this downward trajectory in all the judges. They've got worse and worse from about halfway through judges until we end up with no real judges, just this vileness that priesthood completely corrupted as far as we know, or maybe not completely, but at least partially corrupted. And then Samuel. Samuel. And you think to yourself, okay, how on earth is this little boy Samuel going to be brought up? Because the world that he's brought into is that world I just described to you. This little baby that his mother Hannah that we heard so well from Luke last week, she gives this baby into the midst of that vileness. Now, how many mothers would do that with their little babies? I don't think anyone would. You want to protect your baby, don't you? You want your baby and your, your child to grow up strong. You know, you are all generally as far, you know, you, you all generally want your kids to grow up in the ways of the Lord, don't you? And do you not worry at times about the world out there, how it's going to affect them? I remember in Bougainville, when we were doing peacekeeping operations, they had this 10 year war. It wiped out like 20% of their population. There's only like 100,000 people. It's very, not very well known in Australia. And I remember talking to this dear old guy. A lot of these people are amazing. They kind of literally looked like they'd just come out of the jungle, but some of them had degrees in philosophy and this kind of thing, and they'd start talking about Nietzsche or whatever. I'm not joking, they did. They were, they, they were very well educated, many of them, because of the mines and so forth. But one couple there, and he was one of the leaders uh, of this new kind of peacemaking or peacekeeping operation, a local, he had deliberately stopped having kids with his wife because he didn't want to bring kids into that world. And I understand that. And, you know, even think of yourself as the world is moving on in this trajectory. Aren't you worried yourself about that? 
This is, this, is, this is Samuel's world. This is little baby Samuel's world. Um, is he going to stay faithful? Is he going to stay on the path? Every logical reason would say no. Culture is so powerfully against him. He's been put into the priesthood with Eli. And, you can, and I encourage you to read this story yourself. We don't have time. This is just a movie trailer of Samuel. The whole point of Mega is you, you read it yourself. Um, when you get time, but he's, he's put into a corrupt priesthood. Eli's just letting his kids, his sons sleep around in the temple, dis, dis, disregard, disrespect God's, um, God's sacrifice. And so we might think, just back to my illustration, and then I'm going to let the kids go. We might go, you know what we need to do? This is our spiritual life now. Bit of a mixed bag, looking a little bit yucky. Okay, so what we might do because we don't want the world out there to kind of affect that. We want to protect our kids. So what we'll do is we will isolate ourselves. Now we're safe. Now nothing can get in there. Can it? <laughs> I've covered over the jug with all its stuff. It's water and it's black kind of coffee and it's toys and it's house keys, which Kerry's still now fixated on, I'm sure. No. Um, so kids, you're about to go out to Sunday school. I'm going to give you my sermon in 30 seconds. Rightio. And I'm just going to give you half of it. And you ask your parents later what the rest of it was. You can't live like this, kids. You can't live blocked off from the world with all this stuff just sort of locked up in there. You can't live. And Jesus and God has a much better way for you. That's it. So you can ask your parents. Make sure you ask your parents later. See if they remember. All right, so I'm going to pray for you. Lord, I pray for Kerry. I pray for these really just great kids. I pray that they would grow up strong in the ways of the Lord. They'd grow up being a dweller in the presence of God, of being someone who seeks for God, looks for God, walks with God, understands that he has come as a man, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that they would dedicate their lives to him for the rest of their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So, prepare to read a little bit of Samuel with me. And the big question is, how on earth is this little baby going to go? I mean, far out. We've seen, haven't we, through the mega series in Judges, how the rest of the Judges have gone. Not very good. Not very good at all. We've also seen how the people that the Judges were supposed to minister to and serve have also not gone very well. And if you just want to experience vileness, just read not now, another time, Judges 17 to 21, then keep reading straight into um, Ruth and then keep reading straight into Samuel. And what you'll see there is this stark contrast. But this is the last, Samuel is the last judge, okay? We are told that at the end of his life, he has judged Israel. He's the last judge. And instead of this sort of trajectory ever downward, something else happens. So let's skip to his last words. So we're going to do something a bit weird. We're going to go to the end of the book. Some people read... The ends of novels sometimes, not the start, uh, to see what happens. We're going to read his last words or his last public speech. And we'll just do a test. And we'll see, well, how did he go? So I'm reading 1 Samuel 12, 1 Samuel 12, verse 2. 1 Samuel 12, verse 2. Now you can imagine, since little baby Samuel and from Hannah last week, a lot has happened. 40 years or so have gone past, maybe even 50. Now Saul is on the throne. Samuel's about to, uh, about to die, as far as we know. And this is what he says to the people in a public gathering. Now, be aware as well, his sons, unfortunately, have not turned out the same way as him. So I'll just let you know that. In verse 2, Now you have a king as your leader. As for me, so this is Samuel speaking, I am old and grey. My sons are here with you. I have been your leader from my youth until this day. Here I stand. Testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? From whose hand have I accepted a bribe to make me shut my eyes? If I have done any of these, I will make it right. And then the people say, you have not cheated or oppressed us. You have not taken anything from anyone's hand. So here is a man with faithfulness, hope, love, truthfulness. This is a guy that is of impeccable character. That They have nothing against him. Think back through Judges. 
Think back through the contrast there to your, your mixed bags like Samson, even Gideon, and then Jephthah, and then all the others that have got these, some, in some cases, terrible things that they've done. Samuel said, the Lord is witness against you and also his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. So here is a man who's being faithful and true. How cool is that? You know, everything against him, culture, you know, he shouldn't have turned out this way. And yet here he is, faithful and true for 40 years, Samuel, the last judge. And what a turnaround from the preceding judges. What a turnaround from the vileness of Judges 17 to 21. His life starts really in Judges 17 to 21. And then by the end of his life, instead of vileness, there's this kingdomness. It's amazing. Because not only has he stood true, but now the people around him, the kingdom around him is ready. It's ready for uh, renewal. It's ready to follow Yahweh. They say, yeah, we'll follow him. I mean, have a look at this. Uh, in the rest of the passage there, verse 20 of chapter 12 in 1 Samuel. Don't be afraid, Samuel replied. You have done all this evil. Yet, do not turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Don't turn, don't turn away after useless idols. They can't do you any good, nor can they rescue you, because they're useless. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people, because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. And I will teach you the way that is good and right. This is, this is what this is all about. The good and right way. The faithful way, the true way. In verse 24, But be sure to serve the Lord. Serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. Yet, if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will be swept away. Be, be sure to fear the Lord, Samuel says, and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. Will I burn? Will I burn? My brothers and sisters, be sure to fear the Lord. You little kids, maybe you can't, you, I don't know how much you're going to pick up. Be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your hearts. Consider the great things he's done for you and your family. And for many of you, your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents even. So here is Samuel. He didn't sleep around with a tabernacle staff. He didn't disrespect the sacrifice to God. He didn't indulge in greed, lust, self-interest. He did not live like hell. And yet the world around him was like hell at that time. He did not live like hell at all. And because of his example, a clear call at the end of his life, which no one could distribute, because there's nothing worse than someone standing up there and saying, be sure to fear the, God, fear the Lord, serve him faithfully, be true, when they themselves are not true. That is a disgusting thing that happens right there. He didn't live like hell. He feared the Lord. He served him faithfully. He abided with him. So I'm just like, wow. But we should go to the how, from the wow to the how, okay? How on earth? And I've noticed this one thing, really, in Samuel's life, this what we could call a faithful and true pattern. It's, uh, you know what? It's not, it's not going um, to be a seven-step plan for you to be faithful and true, okay? It's going to be a... Um, presentation of what I see that makes Samuel a faithful and true man through all that hell-like living, all the, all the, all the life around him. So I don't, I don't want you to go away with a seven-step plan, but I do want you to, to, to go away going, well, what does this mean for me? And we'll get to it in a minute, but speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Like, so, so Lord, speak, speak to me. What, what does this mean for me? Because do you understand how important this is? is this is one of the most important things I can tell you because as the world gets darker and it probably will get darker, this here is what is going to see that you will be faithful and true. And I'm not saying that lightly. I'm not overstating it. It's, it's the truth. Already, if you look back in history, many people that have not lived this pattern have fallen away. You are no better than them. And so this truth that I'm about to give you, I want you to just to take it away, to store it in your heart, to think about it, to think about it through the week, to think about it for the sake of your kids. Even if you think it's boring or I've missed the mark, please just get into the word yourself then. But for your kids, for the people that are around you that are so desperate, they're so, they're so thirsty, you know. You know, you look at them, you get all angry because they're doing this, that. And what do you expect from people that are essentially spiritually dehydrated? Of course people do crazy stuff when they're dehydrated. 
They're spiritually dehydrated and you, and you want to judge them and get angry. And what do you expect from people without the Lord Jesus? Well, what do you expect? Can't, can't you do what he did and love them and serve them? And the best thing you can do is look into your own life and go, well, well what's going on with me? How, how, can I, how, can I, how can I serve them? How can I be poured out in a sense? How can spiritual life flow through me and to them? I mean, imagine a world where the kingdom is being, oh, it's really advancing by people who love the Lord. And it's flowing out of us. Anyway, I'm getting offline there a little bit, off track. So this faithful and true pattern, um, just bear with me. Um, this faithful and true pattern, what I want to do is just show you some little movie trailers of what it looks like, but it's really up to you to think through. Let's illustrate with one of the most beautiful stories in the Bible. It's my, one of my favourite. We're just going to skip back now in time to 1 Samuel 3, 1 to 11. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. rare. There was not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the sanctuary of the Lord where the ark was. The Lord called to Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Samuel. Sorry, and he ran to Eli and he said, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called. Again, Yahweh called. Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and he said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel a third time. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and he said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realised that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling as, as, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Now, the word that comes to Samuel is not very encouraging. But it's a necessary word because of all the vileness and everything else that's gone on. And God has had enough of it. So he's about to put a stop to it for the sake of his people. You can read about that later on. But my point here is, is that what's really startling to me about this faithful and true dynamic is this. Because you see it in such a beautiful way. I don't know if you've seen it yourself. There's something really wrong with this thing. So in your Bibles, it might say temple, does it? He was in the temple. So there's no temple in the chronology. The reason they've put temple is because the same Hebrew word for sanctuary has been used for temple, but actually it's the tabernacle, the tabernacle. So Samuel is lying down in the sanctuary or the tabernacle of the Lord. And do you see, I mentioned this earlier in the year, do you see what's wrong with that? Where the ark is. Where's the ark? In the Holy of Holies. So if you just cast your mind back in history a bit, remember when people were sort of disrespecting that Holy of Holy place, they generally just died. Remember Aaron's sons? Dead. So here's this little boy, probably at this stage, probably early teens, maybe 12, 13. And he's lying next to the ark. Now, there's a reason for that, because we already saw it last time. The, the priesthood has become corrupt. They're not necessarily following the ways of the Lord. The ark and the Holy of Holies is probably not being treated with respect as it should. But isn't this a beautiful picture of God's grace? He doesn't strike down the boy. He comes and talks to him. <laughs> And I, I just I want you to have that picture in your head of this little lad lying there next to the ark in the Holy of Holies. Because to me, this is the key to seeing what it is about Samuel's life that makes him a faithful and true person for God. A kingdom person for God, literally. Despite all the vileness around him. And what I want to say to you is, is this idea of, of presencing, of being walking with, seeking God's presence. Now, God has had to reach out to him first, as he always does with us. But now Samuel has become, from the start of his life, a dweller with God, a presencer, if you like. He, he, is, he is with God. Elsewhere in the Bible, it mentions a very similar thing, but in different ways. And you might remember some of these from our mega series. It talks about walking with God. It talks about walking before God. And you can look these up later, perhaps, just do a keyword search. Walking in the ways of God, looking to the Lord, seeking the face of God, serving before God, calling on the name of the Lord, 
abiding in the Lord, friend of God. So this little picture of Samuel just with God, just in relation. This will be mind-blowing to a Muslim. Okay? It will be mind-blowing even to, say, an atheist who was carefully trying to research and understand where we're coming from. Are you saying, Adrian, that a little boy can dwell with God like that? I'm saying yes. <laughs> I'm saying yes, absolutely. This is, this is why we're Christians. We respect our Muslim brothers and sisters, but we're not Muslim because of this. We respect our atheistic brothers and sisters, but we're not atheists because of this and other things, of course. So Samuel, what I want to put to you and show you some little snapshots of movie trailers, he's walking with God, he's walking before God, he's walking in the ways of God, he's looking to the Lord, he's seeking the face of God, he's serving before God, he's calling on the name of the Lord, he's abiding in the Lord, and it goes from vileness to kingdomness. Samuel walks, seeks, looks, serves, calls, abides in and with and before the Lord is God. And by the end, everything's changed. Notice I haven't said he reads his Bible lots. I'm sure he does, whatever version he has of it in the early days. Notice I haven't said he prays lots. He does pray lots. We know that. But it is because of what is going on in his heart. This dwellingness, this presencing. I'm having to make words up because we don't even just because we're just such a doing society. We don't have proper words for it. So I'm gonna make some up. This presencingness. So what does that look like? What does that look like? Well, we can see right from the start for first Samuel 1 28. It's Hannah speaking, his mother. Such a beautiful story. Please read that one as well. So now I, Hannah, give him to the Lord for his whole life he will be giving, given over to the Lord. And see what it says there? And he worshipped the Lord there. He worshipped the Lord. So his whole life in the presence of God, in the presence, in the physical tabernacle. But what I'm going to extrapolate to is a spirituality where he was actually worshipping the Lord, uh, not, not just in this like, sense of genuflecting or, or being on his knees in faith, but, but appreciating, enjoying, loving God like like. God was so big to him because of this presencing. In 1 Samuel 2, 21, we're told that the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. So, of course, it's thinking or intimating there the physical presence, you know, with the, the, the tabernacle. We don't know if the pillar of flame and stuff was still there. It's never mentioned again, so maybe it isn't. We're never told where it went from Exodus, but there's a sense that Samuel was there in the presence of the Lord. And because and, and, and he was there for his whole life, it just fundamentally changed him. You can imagine the, the things that he would have seen. He would have seen the worshippers coming. He would have had access to the early manuscripts of the law. He would have seen the sacrifices, etc., etc. And somehow in it all, he presence with God. He, 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 he just had relationship with God, rapport with God. He was a friend of God. Then in 1 Samuel 3, verse 10, you know that, again, the famous story that I just read to you. Samuel, Samuel. And then Samuel says, speak for your servant is listening. Eli's such a mixed bag, isn't he? You know, he, he gets this right though, doesn't he? He gets it so right. And it's interesting because a dweller with God does a lot of listening. And you think about listening, it's actually passive. It's, it's in many ways, because you're not speaking, you're just listening. And so when we're dwelling presencing with God, there's a sense of just wanting to listen. Now, you've probably said many times this week and over the last few weeks, and this is no guilt trip, this is reality because this is where I'm at as well. Speak Facebook, I'm listening. Speak Twitter, I'm listening. Speak Netflix, I'm listening. Speak Instagram, I'm listening. Speak friends, therapists, public stars, I'm listening. But when was the last time we said, speak God, speak Lord, I'm listening? Because he's not like a ghost in the sky. He's not the force. He's not, what is it, mitochondria? He's not that. He's a person. Yes, he's the divine person, but he's a person. Now, I don't want to set the stakes so high and go, yeah, you're going to hear audible voices, but I do believe that's possible, but I do believe you will. You will. Like, even if we would just stop and just go, Lord, speak, for your servant is listening. That's what dwellers with God do. And the next thing that happens is the Lord continues to appear to, uh, at Shiloh and there he reveals himself to Samuel through his words. So that instance of speak, your servants, it actually goes on and on in Samuel's life is what the word here is saying. 
The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word and he didn't let one word fall to the ground of Samuel. So now we've got this idea of a dweller with God, a presence in him. He's a listener or she's a listener. They're a person of the word. And then as we get more and more into Samuel's life in 1 Samuel 7, verse 3, Samuel says to the whole house of Israel, if you're returning to the Lord with all your heart, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the asterisks and commit yourself to the Lord. So just think about my illustration again now. With all your heart. Here's our problem, right? Your hearts are limited capacitors. They've got, they've got a certain amount that they can handle. And we all come in different shapes, sizes. It's not so much the container, but the, 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 the space that's in. And so, you know, we, what Samuel's saying here is your whole heart. So if I, if I was at this stage to pour more in, what happens? Does someone want to drink now? I'm pouring more and more in. Nobody wants a drink of that. Okay? Nobody wants to drink that. So what Samuel's saying is, with your whole heart, hope that doesn't leak. Your whole heart, like, let, let your heart, empty your heart and... Serve the Lord with your whole heart. It's pretty simple, hey? It's still a little bit discoloured. That coffee's very strong. And so that's what he says. Because for the Israelites, for us, there's all this stuff. It's not, it's not that God's displays. God is thermonuclear. You can't displace God. But he has said in his sovereignty that here are your hearts. Your hearts are yours. Here's this capacity to love. You, I want genuine love. So here's the capacity. Here's, the, here's my grace, my spiritual power, my relationship with you. But... What are, the, what are the things that are in there that are contaminating? And what's really interesting is, is that there's this big story in Samuel about them rejecting God as king. Because if you think about Samuel for his whole life, he's dwelled with, presence with God. He probably wants that for all the people. He's enjoyed God's presence, God's guidance. And he's thinking, man, imagine if the whole, I think he's thinking this, I would be. Uh, imagine if all of Israel could enjoy this, God would literally be their king. And so he's thinking, yep, we're going there, we're going there. And then they come to him and they say, actually, we want, a, we want a king, a physical king, like all the other nations have a king. And so that's what this passage is about, is Samuel's displeased. He actually, he's disappointed. He sees that as sinful in 1 Samuel 8, uh, verse 6. This displeased Samuel. Now, does he get all cranky pants? No, he prays to the Lord. Well, he does get a bit cranky pants, but he doesn't let it get him down in a sense. So he prays to the Lord and the Lord tells him, listen, to all the pe that the people are saying to you, it's not you that they've rejected, it's me they've rejected as their king, as they have done since they came out of Egypt. So they've got this problem, Samuel's sons have gone off the rails, so Samuel's a mixed bag as well to a certain extent. And they're going, well, that's a problem. We don't want judges like that. So instead of going, but we want God as our king, they go, we want another king. And that wasn't God's intent. And yet God is like, he's the sovereign God, and yet he, in a sense, stoops down and goes, all right, I'll give you what you want. I'll give you what you want. Now, isn't it interesting, and you need to read the, first, the rest of the, the story yourself, but isn't it interesting at this point, again, Samuel could have, um, he could have gone, oh, I've had enough. I've had enough of all that. Instead, this is what he says, I will instruct you in the good and right way, only fear the Lord, serve him faithfully with all your heart. And he says, far be it from me to stop praying for you. That's not... See, if, this is what I'm trying to get at, okay, with this, this little illustration, is if, see how quickly that gets poured out? Now imagine the rejection just pours out, it kind of uses that energy up, uses that spiritual life up, and you've got nothing left. What, what happens then? Well, you start looking to other things. You know, more coffee, more things, more whatever. I don't need these people of God, I don't need this church, it's a waste of time, blah, blah, blah. You know, I've had those thoughts. We all have those thoughts at times. But does Samuel do that? Here's the thing about a dweller of God, that they are, they are constantly being refilled by the Lord. So the circumstances aren't what drive them. They belie circumstances. This is the, the little willow tree thing again, a tree that's planted by a stream with its roots that go down deep. It doesn't fear when drought comes. It doesn't fear when circumstances change. It's because its roots go down deep. I don't even know what that looks like for all of you. I just know that that's what God wants for you. 
I don't, I don't want to give you a seven-step plan because I feel that might lead you in the wrong direction of being a doer, not a dweller. It's okay to be a doer as long as you're a dweller. You should never be a doer without being a dweller because the dwelling is where the power comes from. And that's what Samuel did. He walked with God. He walked before God. He walked in the ways of God. He looked to the Lord. He sought the face of God. You know, there's a clear passages that say, look to the Lord in his strength, seek his face. Wherever you see face in the Old Testament, it's presence. Seek his presence always. I love that though, face and presence, the personal presence, the, the face of God. Um, it's crazy, isn't it? It's like, here's this dusty 3,000-year-old story, and I'm telling you to seek God, walk with God. It's astounding. Aren't you astounded by that? Like, it's so radically different to how we're told to do things in the world. But you know what? The only reason I stand up here and say all these things is because if, if Jesus, who was the God of Samuel, if Jesus went to a cross, and we believe historically and all the evidence in antiquity points to this, he then rose from the dead, then these words in the Old Testament, which Jesus completely affirmed over and over again, if that is the case, then for me it's like, well, I need to take notice of what Jesus says about this physical truth that we've seen in Samuel's life. Because he has some words to say about this. And if he has died for me, if he has given up the presence of God in a sense and gone to the cross, which makes him way cooler than Samuel ever will be, then wow. This is, this is not me or Adrian or a fancy schmancy idea. This is God. This is Jesus who died for you saying this to you. In the midst of this dark world that needs some light, that needs some spiritual water, right? I mean, that beautiful scene, Samuel's lying down in the sanctuary of the Lord. It's beautiful, but the Bible tells us that something better has now come. And I don't think we truly understand this, because I don't know how many of you would have liked to have been Samuel. In, come on. In the ta- in the, I mean, in the tabernacle at the ark and, and hearing that voice, hearing your name, Ben, Ben. <laughs> or Adrian, Adrian, or maybe use Parky. I don't know. Would it be Parky? I don't. <laughs> come on, you. Do you you don't want that. It's not much I want it. I want it. Who does love? You know, ultimately, we're going to have that with God. Right now, this, this is just, he's saving the best to last. We're going to have that. You should yearn for that. That's what he's promised. Anyway, that's another sermon. So, um, see this amazing scene. But, but what we're told, and you can read more about this mainly in 2 Corinthians, but the idea of the Old Testament relationship of God with his people, it is superseded by something way better. So it sort of goes from like one dimensional to two, three, four, five, six dimensional. And it starts here with Jesus' words where he says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, i.e., if you abide in me, if you dwell with me, if you presence with me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. There's Samuel. That's Samuel's life. That's Samuel's life. But then he also goes on in the same passage, and you can read this through John sort of 13 on to 16 and 17. If you love me, you'll obey what I command. And you go, okay, what has he commanded? He's just commanded. That's a, that's a command. Abide with me. That's what he's commanding. There's very few commandments in John. Do a study. It's really fascinating. See how many commandments you can come up with. If you abide in me, that's the commandment, abide in me. And then he says, if you love me, you'll obey what I command. Abide in me. Believe in me. Depend on me. And I'll ask the Father and he'll give you a counsellor to be with you forever. And then later on in John, the counsellor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. This is another grand benefit of being a dweller with God. You get taught by God. He becomes your tutor. He has a curriculum for you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I don't give as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Or as Bob said before, do not fear. And this is where I want to end my sermon as we come to, um, as we come to communion and this last, this is one of my favourite passages. Well, I think every passage I'm reading is my favourite passage, so I don't know. But on the last, this is Jesus again, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood up and he said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. So, so don't go to Twitter. 
Don't go to Netflix. They, they have their place, no doubt, but that's not where you'll get spiritual satisfaction unless somehow in there you find Jesus and Jesus' truth, which I'm not saying isn't possible. I think it is. But ultimately, come to Jesus. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, now note here, I'm going to say something uh, fallacious, something wrong. See if you can pick it up. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, a container of living water will be given to you. A pond of living water, an ocean of living water. Is that what it says? Help, help me out, I need some help. What's it say? Thanks, Joe. Streams. <laughs> Streams of living water. And if I could have got a stream to flow through here, I would have. So think about this, right? We, we think we're so worried about the contaminants, you know, the, we, want to co- we want to cover up, we want to maybe keep people safe and so forth because we don't want the junk of life to get into them. And meanwhile, the world's crying out for something, right? Uh, and then we're going, oh, okay. But like I said before, you've got all that junk already inside you. So we're just constantly sort of doing these ones. I feel empty. I feel full. I feel empty. I feel full. Now, I... I get that. That's me as well. But what I want us to look to is the idea that God might have something better for us than that, and he's moving us towards something better than that. Now, it might not be the lightning bolt change immediately, but it might be a lifelong thing. But I don't want you to give up on this. Okay, so I can only replicate a stream for a limited amount of time. All right? Here we go. But I want you to imagine as I'm pouring, uh, the idea that this now is your life because you are one. Right, you're one with the Lord, and in a sense, you're abiding with Him. So it's not your reservoir anymore. In fact, let's just get rid of that. You understand that the 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 grand promise of the Bible is that when you submit and when you believe, when you trust in, depend on, pledge allegiance to Jesus, you become one with Him. In a sense, you you are now dwelling with Him in relationship. It's not your reservoir; it's His, and His reservoir is infinite. And so for the world, right, it's just going to keep going. Now imagine, see the pouring part, right? Or even, even, even this bit here, imagine contaminants are in there, you know, dirty sins and things. What's, what's happening to them? They're just getting washed away. And on and on and on. And that, my friends, is what I really think God wants for us. He doesn't want this idea, this, this very linear idea of, well, here I am, a little reservoir, fill me up again. No. Jesus himself has said it's a stream. It's a stream of living water. Imagine the world. Imagine all those things I talk about, the, the climate issues, the, the horrible injustices and imbalances in the world. Imagine people, like just even just a little group of people here, just a little group, with lives like that, just streams of living water. You know, you see that in Samuel. This is God's country. We can live for him. We can live with him. We can dwell with him. This is God's country. He's winning it back. With or without you, he's winning it back. He's invited you along. He's invited to be, inviting you to, to be a part of his existence, about, of, of his life, to, to have this stream of living water. That's why, you know, I've had this idea of guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my saviour. And my hope is in you all day long. And I'd really like you as my brothers and sisters, don't look for the seven-step plan, but simply go speak for your servant is listening and perhaps go in these matters, Lord, of dwelling, of presencing, of abiding, of seeking God's face always. Would you guide me in that? Would you show me what that looks like? Would you, would you, Lord, it might be hurtful and it might be hard, but all the the stuff that displaces you, in a sense. Would you, would you show me what they are, Lord? Not that you can be displaced, of course, because I feel that I could be so much more than what I am now. And Lord, it might, it might take months or years. Maybe it'll just take a second, who knows. But Lord, would you bring me to that place where I understand truly and I live truly the presencing of God and it flows through me like a stream because we don't carry someone who stands up on some mountain far away and says, come to me, come to me, all you who are heavy laden. 
and show me what you've got. Show me your stuff now. Come on. Get in. Dig in. You're only cheating yourself. Come on. Come on. What does he say? He says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. But then he says, take my yoke upon you. So there's a sense that he's still got stuff for you to do, but it's going to be this stream of living water within you. This makes sense. <laughs> oh, good. Now, um, what I'd like to do, and Becky, if you could just make sure that music's ready, we're going to come to communion. We're going to drink. And it's strange because we're going to um, drink a representation of blood, which is God's life given up for us, Jesus' life given up for us. And as you do that, as you come to His table, you, you're actually acknowledging again that you need to dwell in His presence. So I'm going to have this song play. And I'd just like you to listen to it and then um, we'll have communion together. I've got the lyrics up there as well. That's an awesome song. I guess what today's sermon really been about is the subversive, radical, rebellious nature of our faith. So it belies, subverts, goes rogue against circumstance. And we have no better example of that than the Lord Jesus Christ who really went rogue against death. You expect that in all those circumstances, he'll just stay in the tomb and instead the Holy Spirit, the, the living water, it just flows and bang, out he comes. And so when you come, just remember what you're seeing there is you're seeing a radical rebellion. And it's, it's actually using the very emblems of death, the, very, the, the ultimate circumstance that wants to take your and will take your life, it uses it and flips it on its side, turns it inside out. And now it becomes life. His body broken, his blood spilt. Now it becomes life. It's this ultimate rebellion. A holy divine rebellion against the effects of sin and death. So you come and you come and enjoy, because it's got it's got nothing to do with you. It's all what he has done. All you need to do is come and eat and drink. So let's do that. Let's eat and drink together. We'll keep the cup together. Actually, who would like to break the bread today? I'd like to offer it up to someone else. Johanna. Thank you, Johanna. So Joe will break the bread and it's his body broken for us. The, the juice represents his blood spilt for us. And he calls us to remember him now. Father, make our hearts so open before you today that we hear and understand truly and that we enter into worship as we eat and as we drink. And we remember you in Jesus' name. Amen.